All right, all right. Hello, hello, and welcome to a very special Rock Cut Review stream on a Saturday night. Um, I want to welcome you all, and I especially want to welcome my guest right over here, the man, the myth, the legend, the full Weddle. Ta da! <laughs> um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for being here. Um, so it also, I want to say before I forget, before I say anything else, it's actually Mitch's birthday today. Mm. Yay! Yeah, I turned old. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, happy birthday, Mitch. Should we sing it? Should we sing it? Everyone in the chat sing well, it. I don't think, uh, no, absolutely happy, not. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> copyright struck if you do. <laughs> Does Disney still own Happy Birthday? Is that I don't know. Works? There's a bunch of legal to do about it. Where I don't think I don't know if anybody learns owns it anymore. But yeah, but I'm sure they still want to since it's a oh, huge sure. revenue stream. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's check who who all is in the chat real quick. Kilco, Kilco was hanging out. Good to see you, Kill. Uh, cool. If you haven't subscribed over there, he's got a Whiskey Tube channel as well. Go show him some love. Um, Floydian was digging out his Heaven Hill. Oh, he just came back too. Um, John Gunson is wondering who I will ban tonight. You better be careful, John. It might be you. I was hoping for me personally. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Like, oh, I'm getting a little bit of car dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so bad. I did. I I put up that apology video to Cohen because I really did feel terrible about that. I banned him for like the whole second half of the stream. Uh, I, I felt really bad. Uh, Ice House, another uh, Wisconsin, a Wisconsin person is here. Good to see you. Uh, Wheels, my man, Wheels. Good to see you, Wheels. Andrew Spirell, cheers to whiskey and a Saturday night. Absolutely. John Kranz, hello, hello. Puffs and Drams. And, of course, Patrick Fulmer. Good to see all of you. So glad to have you. So a lot of you probably know Mitch, I would imagine. A lot of you probably know him. I mean, you've you've been around for a minute. You, I mean, you're a, you're a pretty um, you, active member of the whiskey. Are you, are you calling me old? <laughs> around, especially on my birthday, man. Thanks, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I call him like I see him. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, ouch. There's, there's a little bit more gray than there was when I started, right? Oh, I know. I've got a little white coming in in the oh. beard too. And this is this is full on Doctor Strange. If I if I let it grow out, Uh I mean, Halloween's coming up, man. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. Get that going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so Mitch, you are currently a distiller over at Heaven Hill. Yes. And formerly a cooper for Brown Foreman? Yep, Brown Foreman. Yes. Okay. Okay. There we go. There we go. I thought I thought that was correct. So you you get to correct me on everything I say wrong tonight. Oh, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll do my <laughs> best. <laughs> um, so, but before we get into any any shop talk, maybe we should pour something. Hey, sounds great. All right. Well, I've got a few. I've got a few things here because you were so generous. You sent me a bunch of samples of yeah, various well, things that you. Not every day your friend survives a pandemic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I was wondering, should we just start? Should we just start with number one? Sure. Why not? All right. So this is Elijah Craig, uh, Craig, as I say it, Craig, uh, one twenty-five proof, the grenade. Yeah. So this is normally a distillery exclusive, but uh, in Kentucky, you cannot have a distillery exclusive. It is illegal. So realistically, it's a whiskey with terrible distribution and it, the distribution is terrible on purpose. <laughs> Floyd says, I already put my foot in my mouth. I, yeah. I naturally piss people off when I speak. Um, Eric waits here. Hey. Drinks whiskey until it's been butt chugged. It's not, it's not whiskey until it's been in an anal cavity. That's I'm I mean, pretty sure that's as a, a distiller. I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Finally. Um, Floyd actually asked, yeah, he's saying whiskey laws are wild. Is there a reason for that law? Is there a reason that you can't do a distillery exclusive? Uh, that goes to your uh, stream you had the other day about uh, 
whiskey stores and distribution and things like that. So Kentucky has a lot of really weird hangovers from prohibition. Uh, one of them is you can't exclusively distribute to any one location. That's trying to make it as fair as possible, trying to break, like, naturally cause monopolies not to form. Mm. And they also have laws like you must sell alcohol for a profit. So you can't have a loss leader or anything like that. I used to work at Total Wine for a little bit, and there were several things they literally sold for a penny profit just so they could get people in. Right. With big brand names and then try and sell them some other things that they made a lot more profit on. Oh, yeah. When you say Total Wine at my store, you're liable to get slapped. Uh, I also worked at a small independent store that would do the same. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, but tell us a little bit about this, this one in particular. So Elijah Craig, obviously 125 proof, 62.5% alcohol. Right. Uh, so this is, if you've had 1792 full proof, this is a, they riffed on this basically. Uh, this is barrel entry proof for us. We put it in at 125 proof, uh, random law. The government lets you be off by up to 0.2%. Really? But there is another law that says if they have inspected your equipment, it doesn't matter how far off you are because the government signed off on it. Oh. So it basically is you can put it into the barrel up to 125.2 proof knowingly so long as the government's inspected your equipment. So you can sneak in like that 0.2 proof extra to help squeeze a little extra money out. Interesting. Oh man, see, this is this is the kind of kind. This is the kind of stuff I would know. Um, Andrew Sproul asks an interesting question. So, a nonprofit charity-based distillery could not exist. That's an interesting. It could because I mean, based on whether what five hundred one C you are, um, you know, it's it's like Newman's own all profits to charity. They're basically a charitable organization, and you know. Susan G. Komen, whatever you want to say about them, they you know donate nine percent of their profits or something like that to charity, but they're still a five hundred one c three. So you could have a charity. So you would have, you could have you would have to sell your whiskey at a profit, but mm -hmm. where those profits go, absolutely, is, yeah, for sure, that makes sense. Um, wow, this is so now obviously so this is barrel entry proof. Yes. So that means either it it must have it must have actually been higher in the barrel. So when, most of Heaven Hill's rick houses actually do increase the proof uh, based off of the way they're constructed and how high they're constructed. If you look at them, they're not like four roses. They're not like Buffalo Trace with a lot of brick warehouses. They're mostly tall wooden slash metal sided, and those are really great at just pumping the proof up. Really? Okay. So the material, I, I would, I mean, I understand the, the height, definitely that higher temperature would make a huge difference, but the material is important too. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have a well-insulated house, you know, the temper variation, temperature variation, wow, hey, words, right? Temperature <laughs> variation isn't great and it doesn't force the whiskey in and out quite as often. So the more insulated it is, the less uh, evaporation you have. So... Unless, of course, you, your insulation keeps it at like 120 all the time. But it's those temperature fluctuations that really help drive it into the wood, which drives some of your double share. And then tannins only bond with water, so they pick up a lot of the water from the whiskey. Mm -hmm. And then evaporation. If it's really well insulated, you'll just have nigh 100% humidity in there all the time because the airflow isn't that great anymore. And when you have nigh 100% humidity, you, you can't have any more evaporation. The air is already saturated, so angel share is a lot less, less angel share, less uh, proof variance. Wow, okay. So even, so in 100% humidity, alcohol won't come out, water won't come out, you're more or less just sitting? It will, but at an absolute mu much lower rate. It's one of the sure. reasons like Texas in that super dry heat has such a big angel share. It's not just the heat, it's also the humidity. Yeah. And now they're losing a lot of water t just because that's dry air as well. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Um, hey, Cohen, 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 the martyr Cohen. 
I'm so sorry I banned you the other day. I'm so sorry. I don't know if you saw the apology video. I didn't know how else to apologize because I don't have like any social media contact with you. Dude, I'm so sorry. I actually banned you for a full like hour on our stream. I didn't know how to fix it. Dude, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, he's uh, Maker's 46 cast strength and the wood finishing. 61 bucks. That's a good price, man. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good price. It's going for about 80 here in Wisconsin. So that's awesome. It's not findable here in Kentucky. Really? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I think it was at the distillery for a few days, but it sells out within an hour at sure. any liquor store that puts it out. Here now, is that because of just not that much is in the market, or is that because of just super high demand? Super high demand. It's Kentucky. Everybody knows what's what. Everybody knows when the big guys are going to put it out. So there's people who line up in front of the usual suspect liquor stores here every Saturday. And they don't even, you know, release an email that they're going to release anything. People just start lining up. Sometimes, you know, 8, 12 hours in advance just for the shot at getting something. So sure. with BTAC releasing recently, there were a bunch of people lining up. Oh, I believe, I believe. Yeah, we're we're waiting on, on that over here in Wisconsin right now. That hasn't, we haven't seen that yet, but when we do, it'll be, it'll be crazy. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, he was heading over to Scotch for Dummies anyway. He didn't care. <laughs> he didn't give a shit. Uh, <laughs> That's a little, little painful there, man. Oh, painful. No. I'm okay. I can eat crow sometimes. Um, speaking of which, what is everyone else drinking? Sounds like Eric's on the Kilbegan. I like Kilbegan a lot. That is Cooley. That's their, they do a lot of double distilled stuff. I love, I love that. Um, I bought some of that in Texas or California, one of the two, because they don't distribute well here in Kentucky. Jason Busey coming in with a five bucks super chat. Thank you so much, Jason, especially after you dropped a hundred, two hundred dollars on me the other night. Thank you, dude. He's watching some more Hammer 40K videos. All right. I dig it. I see you. That's awesome. I love I'll move my camera around so you can't see my minis. Oh, yeah. This, in addition to being filled with overflow whiskey, this this closet over here is all Warhammer minis and some uh, uh, Malifaux minis as well. So what is everyone else drinking? I'd love to hear. Um, okay, but let's talk about this Elijah. Yeah, I almost finished mine, but I'm trying to do yeah. short pours tonight. So to me though, this isn't super well balanced. This is pretty ethanol forward. Yeah, I mean, it, is it yeah, is hot. It is hot. Twenty-five proof. I know I'm not really supposed to ever say anything bad about the company that employs right. me. Thank you so much. Exactly. But, uh, you know, compared to several other 125-ish proof whiskeys I've had, this is just pretty yeah. ethanol forward. It's you know on the nose. I don't think it's too hot. Maybe it's because I'm sipping out of a teeny tiny Glen Cairn. I mean, me too, right? Yeah. Ed <laughs> and I are roughly the same height, so. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's true. We are we are slightly larger than the average person. Um, hey, Jermaine, on that Turcano. Uh, I think John said he was doing Striker and Glen Morangy La Santa. That actually sounds kind of fun. Yeah. I, I see wish I could get Striker here. Uh, just yeah. driven to Kentucky, please. Um, Aberfeldy for Ice House, and no, I do not get first dibs. Hey, there's no way hell. I don't even get to have a bottle. If I if I want to get a bottle, Erica has to sign up for the lottery, or I have to go to a different store. That's mm -hmm. that's the rules. And I, I think the order store was the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like this. I was, you know, Elijah Craig. I mean, ha Heaven Hill products, I hear a lot of this online. People think Heaven Hill comes off with a very certain nutty note. Um, you know, that people think it has like a certain peanutty note sometimes. I don't really get that in this one at all, though. No, N not for me. I yeah, mean, I might be able to pick up like a little wax that me people might be saying is walnut, but yeah. I, I don't really get nuttiness off of this really at all. For this one, no, this is, this is all... This is 
sweet and delicious. It's very caramely. There is, some, there is some spice there, though. I kind of mm -hmm. dig that. I feel like that extra proof, I don't know if it's that extra proof giving it a little bit more pepper, but there's kind of a wood spice, baking spice, cinnamon thing that I'm really, I'm really enjoying. So I am a whiskey sommelier, and at one of the classes, uh, one of the other whiskey sommeliers, uh, who is a fellow rye guy like you, uh, was telling the difference between rye spice and proof spice. And I completely forgot which one is which. But <laughs> one of them tingles kind of the tip of your tongue, and the other one tingles the side of your tongue. Yeah. That's something my old man always talks about. Is he always, he, for him, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, proof spice is really, and that's pepper that you get on the sides. Mm -hmm. And then, sense. yeah, you get, you get, uh, uh, like, like rye spice, like vegetal spice. That's when it runs over your tongue to the back of your throat. Mm -hmm. But I do think barrel spice and the rye spice are very, can be similar, but they can also be very different. Absolutely. This one, well, I mean, it's, it's almost like both wood and rye are plants. Right. <laughs> right. So, of course, they should be slightly similar. But yeah, like I think wood spice usually tends towards those, it always reminds me kind of sometimes like allspice or like those sweeter spices, your cinnamons. Absolutely. Whereas um, like rye runs a little bit more greenery. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So it's also interesting, rye is actually coated in a very thin membrane of cellulose, hemocellulose, and lignin, which are the three main components of oak. So depending on how long you age your rye, whatever, uh, you can actually only pick up on kind of that membrane and it just mm -hmm. tastes like oak on oak. Sure, sure. So speaking of aging, maybe we should move on to our next one too. What if we do number three right away? Because I'd be interested in this. So this is William Heaven Hill, 16 year old. Right. This one right here. Yeah, yeah. this little guy. Look at that. So this is the, this is one of the special releases that they do every year, uh, William Heaven Hill. This is uh, the single most expensive one that they sell at uh, MSRP. Varies every year. Uh, pro tip, if anybody wants to get super allocated whiskey, come to Kentucky in September when it, there's not a pandemic going on. <laughs> and we'll have uh, the Bourbon Festival going on. And every distillery will put on special events. Uh, Heaven Hill does cigar and jazz night. Uh, other people do other things, but I'm not going to talk about them because I don't work for them, so it's not in my best interest <laughs> to be like, no other places. <laughs> uh, but if you sign up for their VIP, you get a, a chance to buy all of their special editions oh. uh, within a certain limitation. Uh, you don't get to... Like, oh, I'll have a Pappy 23 and a George T. Stagg and an Eagle Rare 17. <laughs> but like at Heaven Hill, I had the opportunity to buy the Old Fitz 14 and the William Heaven Hill 16 and get the small batch select at Four Roses. Ah, cheers, Floyd. Yeah, th good, good thinking, Floyd. Um, so first impressions on this one. I, I was very careful to not do any research on these before, before drinking these tonight. I wanted to go in as blind as possible. Um, this one is is night and day compared to uh, the Elijah Craig. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's about twice as old. Yeah, uh, this is one much drier. Yeah, and it's only 106 proof. So yeah. we've dropped off 19 points of proof. It's dry, but it reminds me, so it's got, it's way less caramely. It's that dry tannic spiciness, but with like also kind of a dried cherry thing, like a Almost like okay. a dry yogurt covered cherry. Mm, yogurt covered cherry. I've never yeah, heard of that one as a descriptor before. I like that. Yeah, like it's it's slightly creamy, but and slightly sweet, but it's still not. It's not like candy sweet. It's not caramel. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I think that for this one, I think they did a really good job balancing a wood influence at a sixteen year old bourbon with you know everything else. Mm hmm. Oh yeah. So I haven't had this since I bought it. I am that guy. Like I had it at the distillery and I was like, Ooh, this is good. I'm buying one. And then <laughs> it's sat on my shelf and people around here, I have a bunch of whiskey. You might've noticed from right. behind me. 
I just come and see the wall and they're like, Oh my God, I don't know what it's like, I am. Yeah. So I just yeah. never opened it. Um, speaking of which, so I had two things I want, I was thinking about. So heaven Hill, your fermentation distillation happens in Louisville, right? Yes. It does. And then your maturation actually happens in Bardstown for the overwhelming majority of the time. Yes. Okay. So, but when, when, is there a time when you wouldn't do maturation in Bardstown? Yes, uh, because it's full. Um, we, <laughs> we have six warehouses uh, in Louisville across the street from the distillery. Uh, we age both bourbon and brandy in those warehouses. Um, we own, oh, some kind of cheap, I think Christian Brothers brandy. Something like that. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we have two warehouse two areas that we age that here in Kentucky and then in California to help with distribution, just so it's not as expensive to ship. You know, like a case of uh, brandy from Kentucky to the West Coast. Uh, so that's where we age all of our brandy that dis distributed on the East Coast. But that doesn't take up all six warehouses. So we have about four warehouses of bourbon that we age uh, in Louisville. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So I was, and this was something else I was thinking about between fermentation. So you're, you're obviously distilling. Yes. Between, between the steps of fermentation and distilling or distilling and maturation, are there quality assurance measures in between those steps or? So, yes, there's more quality assurance in between cooking and distillation than there is between everything else because fermentation a lot can go wrong in fermentation um, you have your primary fermentation that's done by yeast if it's too acidic uh, if it's too hot if it's too cold the fermentation doesn't happen right and you end up just spoiling everything you can scald your cooks mm -hmm. so it tastes burnt and you convert your sugars into carbons and yeast doesn't eat carbon it eats sugar so your y alcohol yields drop uh, there's a secondary fermentation that's done by bacteria. If you don't modulate that correctly, you get a lot of off flavors from that. Uh, if it's not cleaned properly, that tastes disgusting. Um, there's the chance that something happened and there's a steam leak uh, from our boiler. And unfortunately, the boiler isn't pure steam. There's chemicals in it. So we test the, the heck and lot out of anything that's fermenting. Sure. Um, after we distill it, the only uh, quality checks we do are smell, taste, and proof. <laughs> and, um, it, I tell people, like, uh, we're not open to the public, but um, industry insiders kind of get to come through, especially fellow Heaven Hill employees. And it's always fun because they get to sample the white dog. Sure. And I'm like, okay, so you should get really three notes out of this should be alcohol, corn, and metal. If you get anything else, something possibly went wrong. Mm, okay, okay, interesting, interesting. So you, like, right out the gate, you are trying to make, like, obviously consistency is important, but you are going for just a purely, like, as, as just pure corn as possible. Uh, yes and no. Uh, we just still up to about 140 proof. 160 proof is as high as you can go legally. Uh, sure. Once you go that end you really only taste corn metal and alcohol uh it strips so much more flavor out of it you know at, at this end realistically you can still taste some caramel you can every once in a while get some fruit notes things like that but mm -hmm. most people when they're coming through a distillery and they're not used to like 140 ish proof white dog Sure. They're just going to get smacked in the face <laughs> by alcohol. And you're just like, so you should taste alcohol and maybe a couple other things. Like, I'm not really going for, like, you know, Fred Minnick level tasting notes here or sure. anything like sure, that. Sure, that's fair. Um, Eric is asking, how much did you pay me to get on the show tonight? <laughs> uh, I paid him six samples of whiskey. Yeah, right? This is, what he, this is how much he paid. <laughs> I had to go out and buy more sample bottles. Like literally, I was gonna send more, but like I ran out, and I was like, "Oh, that's something he's getting." Ah, um, but actually, Eric Wade's saying he gets green fruit notes from White Dog. Yeah, absolutely. I. I mean, it, it also yeah. depends on the White Dog, right? If it's if we're doing a rye White Dog versus a bourbon White Dog versus 
our weeded bourbon white dog versus our corn whiskey white dog. It really can change the flavor notes, except alcohol is always the number one flavor note. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So you're distilling, so if you're distilling your rye or your corn or whatever, and it doesn't matter what the mash is, you're always taking up to 140? Yeah, that's, uh, that is our goal, is to hit 140 exactly. Okay. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is you can transport it at 140 proof and it's not considered an explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go much higher above that, <laughs> you, you have to fill out dangerous goods bills of ladings and placard, all your tankers and all that stuff. And since we're driving it from Louisville to Bardstown, that becomes kind of a big deal. Um, our water cistern can't proof it down if we get it too high of a proof. Uh, we, we, really? think about it. We, uh, we, we have to send it by the tanker. Like there's no other fiscally responsible way to send that quantity of alcohol that distance, right? We can't build a pipeline. We can't, send it down via bottle or anything like that it's it's tanker so we have an entire tanker of 140 proof whiskey that we need to proof down to 125 proof mm -hmm. so we have this giant reservoir sorry i should make sure my hands are in the, <laughs> the frame so we have this giant reservoir of water and it is so big but if we need more water than is in that reservoir then it's like oh um can you wait like several hours while we have this, <laughs> you know, like fill back up and, you know, efficiencies. That's not really. Right. Right. Time plus, is money. Yeah. It's, it's also just the way they've always done it. And when your consistency is key, so you don't want to be like, Hey guys, we can save a bunch of money if we completely and radically change our process. Why don't we do that? <laughs> right. For sure. Um, one, one, Mr. DJ one, one is wondering how many bottles do you have on your bar? Um, whiskey wise, I have around 300, um, total liquor wise. I have around 500. Yeah. That's impressive. That's impressive. I, I have a, I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> not with drinking, just with yeah, it's not with drinking. Like, <laughs> if I drank, I'd have far less bottles than this. I just, um, Jason, Busey, Jason Busey is saying he gets a funky aftertaste from pot stills, generally like a bad tap water taste. Is that a thing? Yes, absolutely. So, um, the best way to explain this is pot stills are so much shorter than column stills. Um, and when you think about distilling, what you're basically doing is evaporating things. Uh, and there's a lot more stuff in uh, your mash than just straight up water and alcohol. There's all these, you know, esters and congeners and all this other stuff. And those things have weight. So the heavier things get left behind because while it's evaporating, you know, only so much lift is provided by the evaporation. So the shorter it is, the, the more congeners, the more esters, the more all of those non-water alcohol flavonoids or whatever you want to call them get, uh, end up in the final product. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing about that is, is some of those heavier congeners don't taste good. Um, that might be your interpretation of one of them because you know everybody's palate's different. So I don't want to be like, oh yeah, no, they prove it down with bad, <laughs> you know, bad tap water. But it, it could be one of those things where pot stills also go deeper into the tails, deeper into the heads. A column still realistically because it's run twenty four seven. There are no heads and tails. You just set the temperature and go. So it could be a head note that you don't like. It could be a tail note that you don't like. It just depends. So now that's an interesting question because I've definitely had column distilled bourbons. I mean, and whiskeys of all different sorts that taste headsy. Yes. You know, so like, is that because they're saying the temperature too high or, or is that too low? I mean, one way or the other, I don't know. So it's probably too high. Um, no, I'm sorry, too low. So it's exactly opposite what you think. Uh, if the okay. temperature is really high, the, uh, the proof comes off as really low. So you're getting a lot of water evaporation, which can carry a lot more congeners and stuff like that. 
than um, alcohol can. Mm. So the lower your temperature, the more headsy it gets, and the higher your temperature, the low, the the more tailsy it gets. That's that's super. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense when you stop to think about it for a second. But like, yeah, it's it's kind of like opposite of what you would think would be the case. Yeah, just um, yeah, hey, science, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the one thing is, I'm terrible at chemistry, and that's all distillation is. Sure, I'll, I'll read a book, and it'll be like I'm reading. Oak lactone formation and wine and spirits right now, which is a riveting book. Like, let me let me tell you. I believe it. But it's only 100 pages long. And I'm like, oh, I can knock this out in you know, like a couple hours or whatever. I have read the first 35 pages of that book probably 35 times. <laughs> because I keep going and then I'm like, three butyl, four methyl dimonohydroxinate. <laughs> and then I have to Google it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'll keep going and then I'll forget because like I'm trying to teach myself all of these insane <laughs> chemical things yeah. at the same time. And it's like, oh, Mitch. <laughs> um, I, I want to put a pin in that because I want to ask you a question about that. But we have an interesting comment from Kurt Miller who says for him with rye white dog, he gets raisins and dark chocolate. Um, I think that's really interesting. Now we all know Everybody's taste buds are different. I think that's so interesting because I do find ryes, like young ryes that do have a dark chocolate note. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure about the raisins. I, I don't get that so much. I usually get like a peach kind of thing, but like, yeah, dark chocolate for sure. Um, do we, do you have, where are, like, if it's not from a sherry cask or something like that, where, you know, it's a new oak or it's a white dog, where are you getting like chocolatey notes? Is that is that a thing? So, chocolate. A lot of chocolatey notes come from the degradation of your um, lignins and hemocellulose. Um, the thing is, I was talking a little bit earlier about rye having cellulose, humulus, and uh, lignin uh, on the coating. Yeah, on the coating. So mm -hmm. rye does have absolutely those notes in it. Um, but I mean, there's so many ways you can get chocolate. You can get it through aging and wood. You can get it through the appropriate grain. You can get it from how you toasted or dried your grains, much less how you distilled them. Sure. Also, Kurt Miller is, is the guy who uh, explained the difference between rice spice and fruit spice to me. Oh, there we go. He's nice. a Fellow Smollier yeah. and knows a lot about rye. He is, <laughs> when I have questions about rye, I go to him. Well, I'm so glad to have you. Another rye guy in the chat. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to pour another another thing. You actually sent me, you sent me a, a few Heaven Hill things. You also sent me just a couple of things that you really like that are not from Heaven Hill. Um, now, I don't know if we want to talk up the competition too much. Absolutely. I mean, good whiskey is good whiskey. Good whiskey is good whiskey. <laughs> um, so this one, number number two, actually, it's our third one of night, but it'll be number two, is the Knob Creek 125th Anniversary 122.3 Proof. Another another big fella. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No reason to go small. Um, so, and I will say, also, speaking of which, man, this, the William Heaven Hill... I like a lot better than the Elijah Craig. Um, I really like the Elijah Craig, but it is it when you come back to it after the the William, this is much more. It's not cloyingly sweet, but it is much more caramely sweet. It doesn't have that. that Absolutely, it's not as well balanced. Yeah, it's just not as wonderfully like that interesting mix of sweet and spicy that you get with the William. I loved the William Heaven Hill when I had it, and I hate, well, I mean, I hate and love that the secondary markets don't really pick up on William Heaven Hill. Sure. Uh, it, it's priced pretty appropriately to what secondary markets would charge for it, so they mm -hmm. don't go bananas for it. Right, right. But I also think because they don't go bananas for it, it doesn't get the you know, clout it deserves. Sure. Um... I will say, if there are any resellers in the chat right now, fuck yourself. 100%. <laughs> go 
Stop it's watching. Sandpaper. Stop watching the stream. Go find yourself a broomstick and just shove as far as you can. <laughs> <That's laughs> Belch wood. <laughs> um, Kurt Miller saying he drinks mostly Pennsylvania Monongahela, which is one I don't see a lot of here in Wisconsin. We've got kind of our own rye, our own rye style developing here. Mm -hmm. Don't see a lot of Monongahela, but I, what I've had of it, I like. So, Kurt um, and I will. I think I introduced Kurt to um, Peerless Rye, but and then he introduced me to like. 15 other different ryes, like Bad Pat and all that other stuff. <laughs> Kurt knows rye. And oh, I believe Kurt loves rye. If you, Oh, God. If you ever want to learn about rye, talk to Kurt. Oh, that's You're awesome. I would, love, I would love to talk to Kurt. Yeah, yeah. I, I love rye, so that's awesome. I mean, he's a sommelier and a father and a husband and I believe a business owner, if not a business owner, like a really busy businessman. So... Hopefully he can grace us with his knowledge <laughs> because he doesn't have a lot of free time. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, so Knob Creek 125. So this is obviously Beam Suntory. Absolutely. The usual, the usual Knob Creek mash bill. But this Ooh. is, you know what? I kind of wish I had, hadn't had that William Heaven Hill before this. I wish I had. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Like, this still smells really good. But it's so this has a lot more fruit notes on it to me. Like there is an absolutely a cherry in here. I will say there's a cherry. It's not it's not that really deep dark cherry though. No, no, no. It's not like it's not like makers or anything like that where you're just being assaulted with cherry. Right. This is it's a lighter cherry. It's I'm gonna have to get a taste. I gotta get a taste to really figure this one out. Hmm. Hmm. There it is. That's like cherry taffy. That's like saltwater, cherry saltwater taffy. Mm -hmm. Makes I, the this is one of my favorite ones so far mm -hmm. because it really develops as you drink it. Yeah. Uh, to me, it starts off, you know, like a very traditional caramely, slightly sweet. Then it hits a little bit of that cherry. And then it goes into that wood spice, slight tannin note. Then it bounces to uh, a little more spicy and then it just ends on wood tannins and slightly dries my tongue yeah i was trying to i was trying to figure out what spiciness i was thinking there because it's not peppery it's not peppery like the heaven hill was it's more along the lines of like i was thinking marjoram or like herbs to provenance or something just a little not quite as in your face but still just a little bit of a little bit of pokiness absolutely yeah yeah I like it. I like it. But goddamn, that heaven, that William Heaven Hill is going to ruin all other bourbon for me for the night. <laughs> so. oh, you don't know that. You don't know that. Right? <laughs> I, um, but yeah, so I actually had a question for you. Something I was thinking about, because on the stream the other day, I was talking about lactones. Right. And them having, giving a more coconutty flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, but you were saying there's actually multiple different types of lactones that can influence your whiskey. Right. So basically there are, there's one lactone, which has four variations. Um, so when I was talking about that three methyl, four butyl, mm -hmm. that's the start of the chemical compound of the oak lactone. And what it is, is you can replace one of the where one of the oxygens is in it and one of the hydrogens i believe and it'll become a slightly different lactone and then there's an isomer of it which means that it has a different uh bond so instead of having covalent or whatever okay. yeah yeah, yeah. so right i'm not a chemistry major <laughs> i read that and i was like this is what and right. I said, well, it's been a while on Wikipedia and like bought chemistry <laughs> for dummies and stuff like that. So even just moving that one molecule within that lactone changes what flavors you get, and it changes how well your tongue can actually perceive them. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest to perceive is a cis lactone of. 3-methyl-4-butyl, I believe. Um, and the hardest to perceive is a translactone, uh, which is the 3-butyl-5-methyl. You can uh, taste 
the first one at about like literally 20 parts per million uh and the second one does as i mentioned doesn't really come in until like 700 parts per million okay so when you age whiskey that's what makes aging whiskey so difficult you're going to pull out those lactones but you don't know which lactone you're going to pull out and in which quantity so you might pull out a lot of like the coconutty one and then you'll be like oh my god this whiskey's still coconutty we need to pull it at you know like five years every time because we get yeah. coconut five years but it might just be like that one barrel had like one stave in it that was just loaded with you know the coconut lactone sure. and then you'll have another one that just didn't so suddenly you're trying to balance like, oh, we, we want this flavor, but to get it, we need to age it for this long. But once we age it for this long, the one that you know requires 700 parts per million starts coming in and you can taste that. So mm -hmm. does it add complexity or does it override the you know coconut flavor of the first sure. one? Sure, sure. Oh man, that's fantastic. And I'm sure that all has to do with like how the tree grows and how, how it grows, grows, where it grows, the exact species of tree, species of tree, because there are hundreds of species of oak, and yeah. quite a few of them kind of get used. Sure, sure. Um, and I'd love to know. So, before you were distilling, you worked in a cooperage. Yes, this whiskey is actually named after me. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm, I'm serious. I worked at the cooperage that. It was Brown Foreman Cooperage. Brown Foreman put this out. They named it after the Coopers. So that's awesome. That's actually super cool. That's so cool. Ta-da. Um, so yeah, so you were so you were making barrels. So for that job, like obviously you that's I mean, barrels are maybe the most inconsistent part of the whiskey making process in terms of the mat like maturation. Yeah. How do you ensure consistency as much as possible when you're building a barrel? There's two ways of doing that. One is doing like every barrel really bespoke. Mm. Having like one person be like, okay, we need, you know, roughly this amount of grain per inch. We need roughly, there's <laughs> Um, Only if you don't do it correctly. <laughs> um, you know, looking at the grain, thinking about where it grew, trying to keep, you know, trees from the same region together, mm -hmm. uh, keeping the same number of staves in a barrel, trying to keep the circumference the same, things like that. And the, other, and the, the second way is literally the exact opposite of that. Just have it so completely taken out of the hands of anybody that there's no way that there could be any real consistency. Mm. So at Brown Foreman, we used to make like a little over 3,000 barrels a day. Uh, so over the course of 3,000 barrels in a day, you're not going to have trees from only one region. You're not going to have trees with only the similar grain patterns. You're not going to have barrels of the same circumference. You're not. Everything is so varied, but you're making so many of them that eventually like a hundred barrels are just going to be the same just because sure. all probability works. Sure. And then you'll once at the end of the line, you'll have whiskeys that hopefully. You'll ah, Ed, I don't even know if we're still live. Oh no. Ed. But yeah, that, uh, if we're still live, we'll just keep talking. So that's where blending comes in at the very end, taking all those barrels with all those differences. And, uh, blending them together. Certain barrels will be spicier, certain barrels will be sweeter, certain barrels will be darker, certain barrels will be lighter. So you're just, you know, it's literally someone's job to go, okay, is this the same color as the previous run? Is this the same, you know, general flavor as the previous run? And depending on how big of a company you are, how exact is it? No, I can't read. <laughs> the whiskey the Weddell show has begun. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, if you have any questions, Ed's hosting. Um, all right, well, here's a random bit of information for you. Wood cells. What do wood cells look like? They're actually really weird looking. Hey, welcome back, Ed. Ed, you are muted. I cannot hear a word you are saying. Still can't hear a word you are saying. Hello. Hey, 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 you're back. 
There we go. Sorry, guys. It looks like my, my mirrorless camera overheated and decided it didn't want to be a part of the stream anymore. So I'm on, I'm on the old camera. It's probably going to sound like crap, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so anyway, continue. Please, please continue your... Oh, okay. Uh, my bad. Yeah. So uh, wood cells basically look like straws, literally. Um, they're long cylinders that have holes on the end, and that's how they move nutrients around the trees, right? You need nutrients going from the roots all the way to the top of the tree, and it's funneled up through those straws. Um, so, which makes an interesting problem. If there's holes on the end of all the cells, when you make a barrel, why doesn't when the whiskey get into the wood, it just leak immediately all the way up the stave and out the ends. Uh, and that's where tyloses come in. Uh, if you can imagine blowing a, a bubble gum bubble out of the end of both sides of a straw, that's basically what tyloses are. And they just stop the transfer of liquids and other things once uh, they get into the wood. Wow, interesting. Uh, Jason Busey throws in five bucks. Just says I'm mashing buttons again, man. I'm gonna get a bad I, reputation. I called you banning me. I should have called you banning <laughs> you. <laughs> this camera, I gotta work on it a little. This I haven't used this camera, so this this new mirrorless for for streaming too much, and I gotta figure out why it keeps overheating. I think I might have to take out the battery pack and put in a dummy battery. But um. I'm going to move on real quick. I Oh, also, I do want to say I put a drop of water in that Knob Creek. Mm -hmm. I felt like that opened it up. And that doesn't usually happen for me with... with yeah. There's been more, one or that, two that, that's opened up. Yeah, that became way more uh, like... Uh, um, what was I going to say? Like a Ooh, little... Right. I oh, yeah. I, I, oh, I'm trying Whoa. But that cherry got bigger. It got more voluptuous, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I feel like I feel like that wood spice changed a little bit. It wasn't quite just peppery anymore. It was, a, or or what I said before, marjoram or whatever. Like it was yeah. a little bit more like diverse. Kind of had a nice little like Italian seasoning thing to it. Um, I'm gonna pour. Well, let's let's do our last bourbon for the night. This is Old Fitz, 14-year-old. This I've been looking forward to this one. Woohoo, Old Fitz 14. Yeah. I'm looking I've been looking forward to this one. Right. Uh first we got some old Fitz Prime from Ed. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was so you won you won a sample of a, of a bottle you make every day. <laughs> We actually only make it like two days a month. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, that's an interesting question. So, how, like, when you're when you're distilling, you know, like, I'm sure there are there's, I mean, there's a few things you distill that share mash bills. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, basically, if it's just a bourbon, it has the same mash bill as every other bourbon we make. So Elijah Craig, Evan Williams. Uh, Heaven Hill, all that stuff. It's it's only when it's a rye or a corn or a weeded bourbon that it's different. Because yeah. you you're behind a lot of brands, uh, Mellow Corn, mm -hmm. Georgia Moon. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the other ones. You got Heaven Hill Blended Whiskey. You got a yep. lot of different brands. Prestige, I think, was the Heaven Hill. Oh, product. Prestige is one. <laughs> oh man, Prestige is so bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Prestige is totally awful. cool. Okay, you know, you know. <laughs> I, like I tell people, this is like as much as everyone wants to talk about like distilling being art and craft and all that. It's a business. Sure. Like at the end of the day, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't matter how good you are at your craft or how amazing your art is. And prestige makes money. Right. So, so it's going to yeah, stick around, selling. right? As long as it keeps selling. I do think you also make uh, Stephen Foster rye, I think, is one of yours, which. I don't know about that one. I think it might be. That's one of the cheapest rides I've ever bought and actually turned out to be pretty damn good. Oh, hey. So, awesome. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and don't you also do some, and, and maybe you're not allowed to say this or not, but don't you also contract for Lux Road? Yes. So that that's totally, uh, I can talk about that. So we distill 100% oh. of Lux Road's products. Um, they are distilling their own products. They open their own distillery in Bardstown, but it, you know it's too young at the, this point. So for sure, 
Uh, Jason Busey, thank you so Cheers, much for tuning Jason. in, my dude. That's awesome. And thank you for the super chats. Dude, you are so generous. You must make a good amount of money or you are putting yourself into poverty. I don't know which, but We're both. thank you, dude. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but, okay, moving on to the old fits, I will say, coming off those, those rye mash bills, this is a lot. It's so much uh, more mild. Yeah, much more bready. So it's that not, is bottled in bonds, so it's 100 proof. This is actually the lowest proof, I, th I think, of the night. Yeah. Oh, sure. But I like, I like the nose on this because it is very different from the other ones. This that's a little bit more of a citrusy thing for me. The fruit on this oh, is a little different. Yeah. So for me, whenever it's a weeded bourbon, I get so much more cherry than I would normally get. I would. I think it's still very cherry, but like if you rolled cherry, like it reminds me of cherry and orange peel in like an old fashioned or something. Hmm. When you garnish, you when you garnish cherry and you got the orange peel in there, kind of makes it with brandy and sprite because you're from Wisconsin. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh eric w threw in five bucks dude thank you so much that's awesome he says big dick club around here around here though we are the colossal clitoris coalition so yeah i mean you are <laughs> i'm single now so i'm i am the lonely, <laughs> the lonely dick <laughs> um <laughs> And he, and Mark Mark Goings on says Weddell's arms look normal. <laughs> uh, I forgot. I'm not lifting them above my head for a reason. <laughs> um, yeah, but what what does a distilling schedule look like? Like, I mean, it's because like a continuous still can just run around the clock. Are you guys just working? So like, we run twenty four seven. Okay. Um, that's how I got my job there. They used to run twenty four five, and demand got to the point that they were like. It's worth paying literally everyone over time to get, you know, two more days of production. Mm. And uh, their supervisors were like, cool, we get overtime too, right? And they were like, not y'all though. So <laughs> they basically went, okay, well then we need to hire people, you know, to cover our shifts. And they're like, all right, let's do that. And I was like, how about me? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. This is amazing. <laughs> Uh, so I work, I give up every weekend for heaven hell. Um, okay. and, uh, basically we distill all but one shift, uh, one shift per week. We clean the stills. Oh. Um, that's really important. Uh, if bacteria gets in there, it's probably not going to make you sick because we're going to kill the ever loving bejesus out of it when we, you know, distill it. And then it's going to be 140 proof alcohol but it'll make everything absolutely disgusting. It'll cut down on yields. It'll just gum up the whole process. And sometimes literally it will gum up. The, like the, you know, things it, will actually stick. Yeah, it will literally clog the still. Now, unfortunately, stills are basically bombs. Uh, mm. So clogging them is not a good thing. <laughs> sure, sure. So what is, because people, obviously we all know pot stills, you got a batch to still. You got to clean that thing out after every single thing. What is the procedure for cleaning a column still? So basically, um, you switch it over from your mash to water, and then you run water through it for a while, uh, and that's to help loosen any you know charred on grain solids or anything like that. Um, and then we turn the steam off and we run a caustic cleaner through it. And that cleaner is so caustic that it kills everything. There is zero things left alive inside that. Uh, and it's also an incredibly hot, uh, <laughs> uh, an incredibly hot cleaner. So that helps kill everything. So the water basically is there to act as a scrubber. And then the caustic is there to kill anything that gets left behind. And then once a year, we actually open it up and get in like someone. <laughs> so it's five stories tall. And so someone literally suspends themselves from the ceiling and we remove we remove all the graded flooring and they just open up every door and scrub every plate and every square inch oh and man get everything off of it it reminds me of that simpson scene where homer gets picked to uh clean the smokestack 
and they just put him in a giant Brillo pad and lower him down. <laughs> it's <laughs> not super far from that because you have to wear so much PPE while you're doing it because we've cleaned it with caustic. So right. you don't want to get any of that on you ever. Sure. So you have to, you know, be completely covered in PPE. And we normally do it in like November. Uh, so it's really cold oh. because we don't heat the plant sure. because we're you know running a still and all this other stuff that would normally naturally heat it yeah except it's off because we have it open and we're cleaning so like there'll be people there and they'll be wearing overalls and a sweater and then they get into one of those like hazmat suits and then they put on their uh their harness and just susp get suspended from the ceiling that's crazy that's crazy i mean i it makes sense though it makes sense that's how you'd have to clean it yeah, yeah. I mean, elbow grease um, those miracles so this, the old fits, I will say that cherry note on the taste, I said citrusy on the nose, on the taste, that comes off much more saccharine. That is much more like a uh, uh, like, uh, cough drop cherry almost. Not, in a, not necessarily in a bad way. So but, I uh, hate natural cherry flavors. Like if you really gave me don't. a cherry, I'd be like, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but if you gave me a cherry cough drop, I'd be like, ah, oh, cool, thanks, man. And just like pop it in my mouth. <laughs> So I don't like natural cherry flavors. So if I yeah. talk about cherry in a good way, in a whiskey, sure. I don't mean like, oh, this is a Rainier cherry and it's like tart <laughs> and bitter and like all these overlapping flavors. I'm like, ah, oh, no, this tastes like candy. Yeah. Oh no, I love cherry gummies. Like I love cherry, like those little cherries, the twin cherry gummies that they sell. I'm all about those. Um, yeah, What? although we are almost at an hour, I got to get you off because i have to open the shop tomorrow i'm sh i know you've got things going on for sure yeah, i start at 6 a.m tomorrow so yeah oh speaking of which what is a normal day like look for you look like for you so realistically um so we go through almost a million pounds of grain a day so it's a lot of making sure grain drivers show up and everybody gets along and unloading's working um there's really not a lot of people that work there. It's heavily automated, mm -hmm. uh, which is great uh, because it means there's a lot less problems until there is a problem and then everything goes haywire because the automation messes up. So most of the time it's just making sure all the little kinks get worked out. Like, oh, this thing didn't you know, come on when it was supposed to. We've got issues with quality control, stuff like that. Uh, until it's not, until something major goes wrong. <laughs> And then it's run around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to figure <laughs> out what's the most important thing to fix first. Sure, sure. Um, and then I think someone had an interesting question about the cleaning, and I missed it. Oh, Troy Forch, uh, does the new make taste different after it's been cleaned? I would hope not, but... Not really, no. Yeah. Um, it, it's mostly efficiency that gets impacted. Uh, because they'll, we call it candy that gets baked on the side and that imparts the, uh, you know, that insulates the still from the steam. So you have to put more steam into the still to get it to come off at the same proof. Okay. Neat. Um, so I would, I actually would like to talk about that more, but I know our time is short, so I want to I wanna get into our last two. We're not actually do, even doing American anymore. We're going across the ocean real quick. Nope. I'm going to take a look at Hazelburn. And Hazelburn 14 Oloroso Sherry Black Art 4.1. These are a couple you really love. Uh, uh, hey, what are we starting with? Huh? Should we start um, with the, which one should we do first? The, is it the, the hazel burn's less peated, I think? Maybe? Uh, well, the hazel burn it has a much heavier cherry influence. So it's oh, so yeah, let's start with black sweet. art then. Let's start with the black art. I wanted to say hi to DC, by the way. Good to see you, man. Yeah. Um, really, I call it bad grits because we make mostly bourbon and grits are just corn. <laughs> so we make a lot of bad grits. <laughs> Yeah, what do you do with all the spent grain? Oh, yeah. So um, they used to literally just put it into the sewer. And that costs a lot of money because you're putting a lot of solids and, you know, not poo in the sewer. Um, so they got a 
couple centrifuges and they literally spin the grains out of the uh the spent mash um and then after they spin the grains out uh they sell them or deliver them to some industrial grain processor uh, and then eventually if you are all about efficiency you would have an evaporator and after you spin all the grains out you would run it out the evaporator and it would turn into just this really sweet syrup mm. that you would then pour on top of your spent grains to just increase the sugar content wow that's neat okay um that's yeah so sorry i don't want to keep you i have i could keep talking to you about this stuff all night but let's talk about yeah so black art you sent me 4.1 i haven't gotten to I, I intentionally did not try this. So good. This is now. I don't know so what much dark fruit. I don't know what this was aged in, but this reminds me of a red wine right off the bat. I don't. I'm not saying a red wine like it was aged in red wine, but it reminds me of an actual red wine. Like like if it smelled like deep red berries and oh yeah, absolutely. Like a touch of just like a sour. A sour seaweedy thing, like an iod slight iodine, but not like Lafroig yeah. iodine. Just a no, no, no. This to me, this is a master class in restraint. Because God, I forget how old this is. This is forever old. And unfortunately, most of it is black on black, so I can't like read it. Ah, 23 years old. Mm. So for 23 years. For it to come out and not just be like a sherry bomb or a peat bomb or a you know tannin bomb, yeah. to have this much going on and nothing really override the other. Oh it's man, a masterclass in what Brooklyn can do. And the taste on this takes me on a whole different journey too, because if the nose was more like red fruit, that taste is so like a uh, uh, dried fruit and just like. It's not quite meaty, sulfury. Like it didn't get that far. It didn't go overboard, mm -hmm. but it definitely is that nutty, like kind of cashewy, walnutty mix with a little bit, little bit of that dried fruit. Yeah, that I'm digging it. I'm digging it. And the nose, the nose has a slight char, like a slight, like it's not quite smoky, but it's just a slight burn to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so good. Like, you really can't talk about how good this is. Quick. They impress me. Like, every time I kind of overlook them because we drink so much Kilhoman and Lafroy get in this household. And then every time I come back to a Brook Laddie, I'm like, wait, this is, like you say, restraint. We yeah, drink so I mean, much. It's, it's, yeah. I like Ardbeg for the exact opposite reason. Like, Ardbeg is just like, oh, you like smoke? Mm -hmm. You like this note? Welcome to the party. Yeah. So you, get nothing, is, you get nothing but smoke and nothing but the <laughs> nuance yeah. within the smoke, right? Like, so I like to barbecue. So I, you know, like when I barbecue, I barbecue with like three or four different hardwoods because I like the like subtle nuance you can get in different smokes. And to me, that's what like hardbake does. It's there's so much smoke. You're like, what's the nuance in the smoke? Right. Whereas man. this, there's so much going on. You're just like, oh, man, what's the nuance in everything? Oh man, I feel like I can't do this justice right now. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save my little pour for a while because I don't, I don't want to rush this. Even though we do have to get off the air pretty soon. Right. Um, and then let's take a peek at this little hazel, hazel burn you sent me because this is the Oloroso sherry. I do love so, sherry whiskey. So good. Yeah. So I call myself a sherry slut. Uh, because I love <laughs> sherry finished whiskeys. Like that's what got me into scotch was sherry finished whiskeys. Sure. And obviously this is this is uh Campbelltown. Yes. Which is the makers of Spring Bank, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Um oh wow. Like this 4.1 is sherried for sure. This but, is a sherry bomb. But this is a Campbelltown sherry. Bomb. Yeah, this is funky this is funky ass sherry you guys yeah Woo! so like most people i started campbelltown and springbank and i to upset john for striding i didn't think it was that great <laughs> um and then i tried long grill and i was like oh 
Yeah. Oh, you didn't, you didn't let me know. Like if you just <laughs> said, I would have, I would, I would have understood, but you didn't let me know. Right. So right. then outside of spring bank, I started exploring a little more in this hazel burn. Like um, it just was like, Oh, you like this in particular fiddle. Well, let's create an orchestra of this fiddle. Like right. it just found my fiddle and played the ever loving the Jesus out of it. Um, James Richard is asking bigger cherry bomb than Aberlauer. I, well, I'll, I'll let you answer first because I have an opinion, but I'll let you answer first. I would say no, because in my opinion, Abelauer is all about the sherry and it's all about subtle nuances on the sherry in effect. Whereas this is definitively a Campbelltown whiskey that has that Campbelltown funk and mm. it's got other things going on. So in my opinion, it's, it's a more complex whiskey. I would There's also more say, going on. I was going to say, cause this, Oh, this is fucking amazing. This is fucking amazing. Um, I will say, I think it's also a different type of sherry. I think of Abelauer as being much more fruity sherry. Yeah, Pedro Jimenez versus Oloroso. Yeah, this is this is very nutty. It's it's edging into sulfury almost, almost like a meaty sulfur, as you know. Mm -hmm. But like I think part of that is because there is this like burn spice it reminds me of when my old man would make creole catfish and he would burn the piss out of it that's the aftertaste the after yeah. the finish is just all burned spice and meat and just oh oh like the front is, is nutty and, and sulfury the end is boom just oh charred meat man it's, it's so good. I was looking to see if they said that they were first fill or not. And I think Abelor uses a lot of first fill sherry. And I don't believe that this is like a lot of first fill sherry. Sure. Because this is Oloroso cast matured, not Oloroso cast finished. So sure. I think that means it's spent 14 years in the sherry cask. Yeah. So if you had spent 14 years in a first fill sherry cask, you would have a really high proof sherry. Yeah, like yeah. At the end. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now this this is, I this is very sherry forward, but it is a subtle kind of sherry. I will say. I, mean, I love the nuance at the beginning because it's sherry mixed with like some of the things I absolutely love about Scotch whiskey. It's got a little bit of that malt funk. It's got that oil content. It's got a little bit of that salt, and then the sherry dissolves as the peat ramps up, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy that. Yeah. So now, actually, I'm I'm curious about that because I'm curious about Hazelburn. I'm going to do a quick search. I know we got to get you off. I'm sorry. That's no problem. I'm just making. Unfortunately, I'm on call 24/7. So when my phone goes off, I have to check it. Uh, I'm not trying to be a, a douche to everybody. I'm. My, my so dad. apparently, so I'm looking at this, and this is saying Hazelburn is the unpeated variant, which. is which is crazy to me. Well, I mean, that's in nuts. my opinion, this tastes peated. This like, does it, taste it peated. could just be the Campbelltown funk, but I swear. No, you're right. You are you a you are a hundred percent right. This tastes peated, and I want I wanted to look up Hazelburn like PPM, which is what I just searched because I was interested. Because, but apparently, this is unpeated. I guess that's it nuts. It is possible, crazy. you know. You get that funk combination with that char, and you know suddenly it's like oh the smoke from the char and the funk from the yeah. This but to is, me, this is this is this has some smoke. This has some yeah, deep absolutely smoke. And, but like, like I say, like burned meat, not like burned wood. Like damn, yeah. damn, that's yeah. that's crazy. That's fucking so, so crazy. I, I guess Kurt's saying he gets the same peat flavor. More money, unfortunately. Yeah, he's getting, he says he gets the same peat flavor, flavor as well. <laughs> Apparently, okay. they don't clean clean there as <laughs> well after peat. <laughs> you know what else it could be? If they're doing it in refill casks, there may have been some peated stuff in the Absolutely. cask beforehand. Mm -hmm. So who knows? There could have been some of that. James is also saying happy birthday, Mitch. Thanks, James. Uh, um, real quick. If we got a couple, we got a couple minutes. If anybody has any more questions for Mitch about Heaven Hill, 
about distillation, about cooperages, coopering. About wood. I know wood. wood really well. He knows wood. He knows wood. And you put it in my hand, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's, that's my wood. Yeah. That's wood. Um, if anyone has any quick questions, we can get those in. But me and him both have to work in the morning tomorrow. So <laughs> I've been pouring very light, <laughs> trying to get yeah. to six. Um, I did have one thing. Finished bourbons right now, big thing. Yeah. Evan Hill gonna jump on that on that train. So we, we just released uh, toasted barrel Elijah Craig. Oh, yep. We did I so, do remember. everyone's been asking me about that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Um I wish I got oh man. So Connor O'Driscoll, the master distiller, and Abby Long and our uh what's that thing you do in college where you have to work with someone? It's not a work study, but like a well, anyway, we had a college student come work at the uh Oh internship. Work. Yeah, there you go. They uh got to go through all the Elijah Craig single barrel and be like, this is what it tastes like after like one month in toasted barrel. This is what it tasted like after two months, after three months, after four months. And they chose the best one. And I am so jealous that they were the ones that got to do that. And not me. <laughs> I want to drink the really good whiskey too. <laughs> But um, no, no interesting port or sherry finishes on the horizon. Uh, nothing that uh, they've told me about, and even if they did tell me about it, I'd really not be able to. You're tell not me. supposed to tell us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm asking you questions that you can't say in public. <laughs> That's fine. Um, That's the worst they can do. Just sue me out of my house. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I did think. I think I missed a question a little while ago. Someone was asking about putting lactose. Fermenting with lactose. Uh, yes. So almost all fermentations actually ferment with lactose as well. Uh, so there's your initial fermentation with yeast, and then the yeast will die off, and bacteria will come in. And most of the bacteria is lactose bacteria. So there is a second lactic fermentation. Mm. Uh, Getting great lactic bacteria to do your second ferment makes an amazing whiskey. Like um, we we shoot for a secondary fermentation with lactic bacteria. Uh, that's one of the reasons like a lot of people closely guard their strains of yeast and where they distill because those all influence what bacteria comes in. Oh, I had I had no idea. So. These are little bacteria that they're eating lactose and pooping out alcohol? Um, so not exactly. So the bacteria, bacteria eats protein, yeast eats carbohydrates. Okay. So the bacteria eats the protein and the, uh, the mix and converts it into carbohydrates because carbohydrates is the fuel of everything. And then the... It's not exactly fermentation because it doesn't necessarily create more alcohol. It just creates more flavor. Okay. And then those bacteria poop out instead of alcohol, flavor. Flavors. Okay. Sure. Like little, they poop out little congeners to make. Yeah. It taste yeah. 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 <laughs> In case y'all didn't know, you are eating yeast and bacteria poop and pee or drinking. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> if I made whiskey terrible for you. <laughs> as long as it's good. Um, and then one last question uh, from Troy Froch, uh, Forge. I'm going to cut it off here. This is the last question for the night because we got to go. Have we tried the Colorado Whiskey 291 that has aspirin staves in it? I haven't even heard of that. I haven't. Uh, 291 down here is like $150 a bottle or something like that, maybe a little more. And uh, I've kind of – I've got – a lot of whiskey so i'm kind of unless i know it's going to be absolutely amazing or it's on crazy sale i don't buy it um so i haven't had that one but some someone around here that does a lot of crazy barrel finishes that i highly recommend everybody looking into despite not being whiskey is copper and kings uh they're a brandy company but oh my god they do so many amazing things with finishes I have uh, probably a dozen Copper and Kings, and I've got a Sherry finished Copper and Kings because I'm a Sherry slut. But uh, I've got an Imperial uh, Stout finished uh, 
copper and kings where they aged it in a used Sierra Nevada narwhal barrel. So it takes all these like amazing brandy flavors and they pot still. So there's all these lovely oils and congeners in there. And then it adds all these like chocolate and char notes to it. And then I, I've got an apple brandy finished in a tequila barrel. I've got, they've done gins finished in juniper barrels. Just all sorts of absolutely amazing finishes. If you have a chance to look up Copper and Kings, I really encourage you to, despite the fact that they are direct competition because they just got that out, bought out by Constellation Brands. So, <laughs> so don't don't buy too many. Buy some. Don't buy too many. Also buy some Heaven Hill brandy. Exactly. Um, James says it's like sixty bucks. I don't. Who knows? Vagaries of distribution, isn't it? Um, I, I just had a thought with this hazel burn, with the sulfury note. This was something I was talking about with sommelier. Rancio. This was this is something I was talking about with sommelier. The difference between sulfur and rancio. And anyway, we don't have time to talk about that. I would love to. We could have a whole discussion about rancio and what what contributes to that taste in whiskey. But we're not going to do it right now because we got to go. Um, everybody. Mitch Weddle, this man right here, has a YouTube channel. I only have one video right now. I'm hoping I only have one video right now. <laughs> what can but I, he's going to change he that. Somewhere. He's going to change that soon, I'm sure. So you got to go subscribe to Whiskey Weddle. I want, as soon as, as soon as you're out of this screen, I want you to go subscribe. I definitely want you to go subscribe to, to Weddle. Don't, don't you? I want to see 30 subscribers on his channel immediately after this video. If, if you don't subscribe, don't bother coming back. <laughs> Come back anyway. <laughs> um, and then uh, also, please hit the like button. Please hit the like button before you leave. Also, come on, hit that like button. And subscribe if you have. Subscribe to this channel, too, if you haven't already. Uh, well, any closing remarks? Um, I could steal yours. <laughs> hey, Rob. <laughs> Until next time, you can finish it. Stay rotten. All right, everybody.